Hi, welcome to the Chapter 2 lecture for U.S. History. Uh, this will cover the English colonies. So we'll talk about sort of the, the concept of colonization, um, how English colonies were settled, and some of the differences between the regions of the colonies, and then also um, how they interacted with the Native Americans. So, uh, we do need to go into a little bit of background on the English. Um, specifically in the English in the 1600s, right? So Jamestown is settled in 1607, and that's the first um, sort of successful permanent settlement that we have. Um, <clears throat> I think we talked a little bit the last time about um, the... No, now that I think about it, that was probably my government class. Um, I don't think we've talked about the Magna Carta and the English Bill of Rights. Uh, but what you need to understand is that the the English, while it is a monarchy, um, did have a, a governing document, which is the Magna Carta. They also wrote the English Bill of Rights, um, and they have a parliament, which is it's 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 a little bit different. There's some structural differences between a parliament and a congress, but it's sort of similar um, in that regard. And so the the parliament is is a significant. Um, factor in terms of British governmental power and how British government actually functions. Um, and then the English sort of economics um, also matters um, because in reality you'll, you'll notice or what you should notice by the end of this is that a significant amount of what the, the colonists do, a significant amount of the foundation of the United States or what becomes the United States is actually economically driven. Um, we, we have this tendency to believe that um, that our, our sort of founding was based on this concept of, you know, escaping religious persecution and, and religious freedom and tolerance and all of that stuff. And there are certainly some aspects of that up in, in the New England area, um, but it's a misconception to say that that's prominent everywhere. Thank you. Um, so as, as I mentioned a second ago, religion... Um, does play a little bit of a factor uh, in England at the time. Um, so England, like most of Europe, had been Catholic. Um, Catholicism sort of is on the outs. You have the rise of the Anglican Church, um, and and then within the Anglican Church and within the Catholic Church, you have the Reformation and people that want to reform and Calvinists and Lutherans and all of these all of these different types of sects that all believe slightly different things and want to see religion function slightly differently. Um, and so there is some, some issues in England um, as it pertains to religious freedom and, and sort of religious practice. Um, <clears throat> English succession, I don't, I don't care particularly about this. Here's what you actually need to know. Um, so basically, the, the England is a monarchy. It's been a monarchy for forever. It's still a monarchy today, technically. Um, there was some kings, um, and James I and Charles I there are two really good examples, um, not just in England but everywhere, who believed in, in what, what, is, what is called in a world history concept the divine right of kings, right? We don't really talk about it in U.S. history because we don't have kings. But the idea of the divine right of kings is that essentially kings can do whatever they want because they are responsible only to God because God put them in their position because they happen to be born into the correct family or whatever. Um, Parliament's not down with that. They're not okay with that. That's not... Um, feasible. It's not acceptable to them. Um, so there, there ends up being a little bit of, a, of an English sort of civil war in the 1660s, I think. Um, I think it's 1660s. I'm not an English history guy. Um, it, ultimately, they, they, the parliament wins, the people win, um, and the king is, is, the monarchy is dissolved. Um, and so that's Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell there uh, basically governs as king, although not with that title, um, nor is he um, sort of royalty in, in, in the sense of the bloodline. Uh, after he dies, they try to give it over to his son, which kind of makes it like a monarchy. His son was terrible and weak, and so Parliament's like, ah, we got to do something. Um, one of the things that you'll learn in a government class is that um, 
that having sort of a, a what what we refer to in our system as a chief executive um, and a monarch fa- uh, fits into that that category um, is actually beneficial in, in some regards. And so uh, the English reestablish the throne. Um, Charles rules, uh, I think, until his death, and then James takes over, and then James doesn't last very long either because he again religious issues and 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 some issues pertaining to how they want to rule and what um what level of involvement they're going to allow parliament to have um ultimately it gets sort of worked out parliament's running things but you still have a monarchy and that's what you see in england today um so the glorious revolution this is the revolution that i just talked about this is what creates the bill uh, the english bill of rights um so you essentially have um, the 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 removal of the monarchy, um, Parliament re, uh, establishing more control or more um, uh, authority within their government, um, and then after the Glorious Revolution, there's something called the Reformation, uh, the, the Reformation, the Restoration, Restoration, excuse me, um, in which they give the the monarchy back and reestablish the monarchy. But, but ultimately, the idea here is um, that power comes from the people. And, and it's, look, I, mean, I don't really care about English history. I don't. But it's important for you to at least understand this on some level because it's going to impact what happens in the colonies and how the colonies set up their, their country and how the colonies um, sort of govern themselves early on. All right. Um, so settling the Chesapeake, this is the the – the area of Virginia. So I think I told you earlier, Jamestown um, in 1607 is the first uh, the first permanent settlement, right? The first settlement that lasts. Um, what you need to understand is that that one, first of all, England is not the only country in this game, right? So um, England, uh, the Dutch, the Netherlands, uh, the French, the Spanish, the Portuguese, um, they're all sort of scrambling um, to try to exert some sort of dominance in the new world or or really just sort of exploit, get rich off the new world, um, however they can. And the English system is a little bit different because basically in, the, in, the, in, in your other European nations, um, you're sailing for the nation itself. You, uh, you, mean you claim land in the name of the nation itself, um, and then you essentially colonize. Right. And, and when I say colonize, I mean, like they, they, these are are, you know, part they, they essentially become part of the, um, you know, the territory of, of the crown. The English system is a little bit different um, and it, it goes back to that concept of English economics. And so we're, we're a century. It's, I mean, we're a century too early for um, the, the economic theory of capitalism and Adam Smith's A Wealth of Nations. Um, but what we have are, are what are called joint stock companies. And so if you understand anything about stock or if you understand anything about economics, not that I would expect you to, um, stock is essentially ownership in a company. Okay, um, And so what stock does is it allows companies to basically crowdsource or, f- or fundraise, right? They, they bring in a whole bunch of money because people purchase stock in the company, and then they use that, that revenue in order to run the company. And then theoretically, they turn a profit, and then some of those profits trickle back down to those stockholders. And that's the idea here in the English system, because the idea is, is we're going to spread out the risk. And it's a substantial risk. You need to understand that it takes months, two months, to get from England to the New World on a ship. Um, Within those two months, you have all kinds of shipwrecks, you have all kinds of hunger issues, you have people that get to the New World, um, like the Lost Colony of Roanoke, that get here and then are, are unsuccessful, and so they die off. And so there's a lot of risk in coming to the New World. And the joint stock companies allow that risk, economic risk at least, to be spread out over a group of people. Um, so the land grants... Right. So basically the company is getting land grants. And this is kind of a comical concept because the idea of land grants um, provided by European nations in the new world um, is is. One, it's sort of arbitrary. Um, And if you go if you if you know anything about world history and you go look at like the Potsdam Conference, which was eight, eighteen, 
48 maybe i don't remember the year um but it's basically where european nations just drew a whole bunch of lines in the african continent and divided it up i mean they drafted it like it was the nfl style draft like i'm gonna take this territory you take this territory that's why at one point in time you have like italian ethiopia and like dutch ethiopia and and it's why you have problems in Africa today because you have these arbitrary lines that were drawn that then force um, sort of competing or warring um, ethnicities, nationalities, tribes, whatever you want to call them. Um, they're they're lumped into the same same nation, right? I mean, Iraq is a, is another good example. You have Shiite and Sunni Muslims um, that don't get along. They don't. They're 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 sort of enemies to one another and yet they're lumped into one nation because a white dude just arbitrarily drew a line and went hey here's a country um so the 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 land grants themselves are a little sort of comical in terms of you know a a, a european uh entity just being like hey here's here's your land um it does solve some of the issues though amongst the colonists amongst the white people um, because white people have sort of a sense of land ownership um, where some native american tribes the the concept of land ownership didn't even really exist yet um so the 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 early virginia colony right um when it initially gets there you've you've probably seen um the, the old disney movie pocahontas and john smith and that beautiful little love story which it is not i mean it's disney like disney just lies about stuff um that's not what it is john smith is like uh he's like 40 and pocahontas is like 13 all right um so it's now also understand that that you're talking way back then i mean girls became adults at 13 um so that's not that uncommon but it's still it's nowhere near sort of like the disney um, version of it um but initially what happened is is the the colonists get there they're they're very ill prepared um most of the people that arrive are not they're not prepared to work um which is astounding to me because if you go to a new land, if you go to a new world, if you go to an uh, sort of uncultured or uncivilized or unstructured place, um, you should expect to work very, very hard because you're going to have to clear land, you're going to have to build homes, churches, uh, you know, you're going to have to create all sorts of, of what's called infrastructure, which we take for granted, right? But like the idea of roads, um, you have to build these things, you have to create them because they don't exist. And yet the majority of our, um, our, our settlers who come, they're not prepared to work. They're not prepared to, to clear land and they're not prepared to build houses and they're not prepared to, to farm and work the land. They're coming because there's this unrealistic expectation um, that you're just going to sort of land and then wander into the forest a little bit and find a pot of gold and go home and be rich. Um, and that's not, I mean, obviously that's not, that's not feasible. It's not how it happens. Um, if, if you know anything geographically, I mean, there's not a lot of gold along the East coast of the United States period. Um, so it's not, it's not something that, uh, that happens. And so the early colonists struggled immensely. Um, and in fact, in a lot of places, uh, early colonies would have died out if it weren't for Native American help, um, which I'm sure the Native Americans regret to this day. Um, but eventually, the the in Virginia specifically, they'll they'll begin to clear land, they'll begin to grow, they'll begin to farm, they'll begin to um, sort of sustain themselves. And then once they start planting tobacco, tobacco becomes a, a major source of revenue, becomes a huge cash crop. Um, so tobacco leaves are dried and then sent back to, to Europe and smoking becomes this big thing. And it's a, it's a, it's like a status symbol, right? Like if you, if you smoke, you know, very fine tobacco, you're wealthier than other people. Um, in order to, to make money and in order to, um, be profitable, um, especially in your, your, your Southern colonies. Uh, one of the things that you, you ultimately need is you need a source of labor. Um, and so you'll, we know now that, that, that ultimately that labor becomes African slaves. Um, but there were some earlier attempts, 
um, at finding slave or finding labor um, in, in the new world in the colonies. Um, one of them is the, is the concept of the idea of indentured servanthood. Um, and so indentured servants are people that came from um, Europe and, and essentially they were they were generally poor. They didn't have much. They didn't have money. They didn't even have the passage. Like they couldn't afford to uh, pay their way to the new world. And so somebody else would pay their way. And then when they got here, uh, they would go and work for that person for four years or seven years or whatever it was. And then at the end of that contract, um, they would be free. And, and generally they were given, you know, a mule um, or a horse um, and a little bit of, you know, maybe a plow or something like that. And then they were sent off on their way and they would go and sort of stake out their own claim of some land and clear it and begin farming themselves. Um, ultimately, it's, it's not a, it's not terrible. Um, I mean, as, as far as the people that were paying for the passage, um, it's not terrible, but you're paying for the passage and then ultimately you're giving up your, your labor after four years or seven years or whatever the terms uh, uh, were, whatever terms were agreed upon. Um, and so ultimately, you would be better off if you paid for somebody's essentially paid for their passage to come here and you just got to keep them forever. Um, one of the, the ideas um, that they tried to do, um, uh, they actually tried to enslave Native Americans, um, and that didn't didn't go very well uh, for white folks, predominantly because you, you enslaving natives on their own land um, didn't really work because they were capable of, of sort of running away. Like they knew where to go. They knew where to go for help. They knew regionally, they knew geography, they, they knew where they were going and they could go to other Native American tribes and, uh, and get help. Um, so 1619, you see the first slaves, African slaves coming over here. Um, they don't have the same sort of luxury, right? When they run away, they run out into the wilderness and then they're sort of on their own. Um, and they don't have the same sort of safety net and structure and they don't know the land. Um, so it's far less likely um, that slaves would run away successfully. Um, ultimately, the, the Virginia company declares bankruptcy and Virginia becomes a royal colony. Um, which basically just means that they they get a decree from the monarchy, from the crown, saying that, that they can continue to operate. Um, that's just a photo of Pocahontas, um, or a, a depiction of her. Um, if memory serves, she went back to... Um, she went back to England with John Smith at some point, and I think actually lived out like the rest of her days there as... as Sadly, it's sort of like a sideshow. Um, people weren't accustomed to um, some of the, the sort of genetic differences in terms of skin tone and, and things like that. And so um, natives sort of became an oddity um, that, were, that were at times sort of put on display in English society, which is really wrong if you think about it today. But um, I mean, back then, you know, it's, it's sort of deemed as scientific discovery. Um, Bacon's Rebellion in Virginia, this is an early instance of, of sort of unrest, um, and it's really a good example, it's really indicative of um, some of the early struggles of the colonies, uh, because again, when we talked about with the indentured servants, you know, you would come here with nothing, you busted your butt for, for a number of years, basically working to help make somebody else richer, um, and then, you know, with the hope that, that you might have an opportunity to um, amass a little bit of wealth yourself. And so your elites, your really rich, your wealthy are, um, are controlling or dictating um, a lot of the, the aspects of life in the new world. And they're profiting um, off of that uh, sort of considerably, right? It's, it's, not a, it's not a system that's set up uh, with any sort of equity or, or even equitable opportunities. Um, and so Bacon's Rebellion is an example of, of sort of these uh, former indentured servants, um, you know, small farmers, more out on the frontier, um, who feel that they are, um, and rightfully so, feel that they're being, you know, uh, taken advantage of by an elitist, um, you know, regional government that's that's operating on behalf of the crown. Uh, Maryland, if you know Maryland, Maryland's right above Virginia. Um, Maryland is a is another early um, 
colony. It's the first propri proprietary colony, which means that it's owned by a single individual. Um, and Maryland is uh, very interesting because Maryland is actually the, the, it's sort of known as the Catholic colony, right? So the Maryland Toleration Act, Catholics are, are um, welcome in Maryland. So Maryland is, is operates under a sort of a sense of religious freedom um, that you don't see in some other regions uh, of the colonies. Um, this is just a map that shows you sort of uh, the, the charters granted to Maryland, and then Virginia is obviously on there as well, but, but land that was given to Maryland versus what Maryland has today. New England is a little bit different than your Chesapeake colonies. Um, so one within New England, you generally had more um, sort of middle class um, families of European descent that are paying their own way. You don't have the same level of indentured servanthood. Um, and, and in the, the New England area, um, I mean, you don't have sort of commercial farming. Commercial farming is not really feasible up in the north because the grow season is so short. doesn't mean you can't grow crops in Massachusetts. It just means that um, you don't grow crops for... Um, a significant amount of the time, whereas, you know, down in the south, you can essentially you can have almost two um, planting slash harvest seasons, and you're basically growing crops twice a year. Um, that doesn't really happen in the New England area. So you have very small farms. Um, ultimately, the, the New England area, when you get into um, the 18th century, the New England area will be the, the sort of mercantile area, right? They're going to be the, the, the area of the the colonies that becomes middle class and, and entrepreneurial. Um, but early on um, with the, the Plymouth Colony and the Mayflower Compact, um, it is religious freedom that these people are seeking, um, but not necessarily tolerance. Um, that's just a, a depiction of what it was like to cross the Atlantic, which was not an easy task or an easy feat by any stretch of the imagination. We talked about that a minute ago. Um, so when we get to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, the this is these are the Puritans, um, which we typically think of um, when we think of that idea of the you know the the, the English or the 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 Europeans that are trying to escape religious persecution. Um, the Puritans were, were a part of that, but they don't come um, preaching religious tolerance. In fact, in Massachusetts, if you wanted to vote, for instance, um, you had to be a member of the church. You don't have the same um, sort of religious freedom that we think of as being essential to America today. Um, Winthrop is, is the first governor. Um, he creates this concept of uh, a city upon a hill. Um, which actually becomes sort of a motif throughout American politics. The idea of a city upon a hill is that um, that they set out to create a society that would or should be impl uh, uh, should be uh, uh, mirrored by uh, by everyone else. It, it should be sort of the exemplary um, sort of society. Um, and ultimately, what what happens is is the the Massachusetts Bay Colony, the, the trading company up there is going to ultimately run or, or, get, or going to become the government, right? Because the trading company has um, sort of rules. It has a hierarchy. It has a structure, things that government ultimately needs um, because the Puritans were not necessarily well equipped to, to establish a government when they arrived. Um, there is some dissension uh, within within Massachusetts. I told you a minute ago there's... there's you know, in order to vote, for instance, you had to be a member of the church. Um, there are some people that are not okay with that. Um, there are some people that don't want to sort of abide by the Puritan uh, way of life. And the Puritans are not about religious tolerance. It's their way um, or the highway, essentially, is in, in, in terms of how, um, how you lead your individual life. Um, which leads to some splinter or some new um, colonies up in the, the New England area. Ma uh, Rhode Island is a very good example, right? So um, Roger Williams um, is actually, he's, he end up, ends up being banished from Massachusetts. Uh, he doesn't really get along with the Puritans. 
Um, and so he's going to go and set up his own colony in Rhode Island um, where uh, he has, for instance, religious freedom, right? So there, um, all white male landowners are allowed to vote and participate in the government. Um, they, they become official by getting a, a, a royal charter um, so that they can operate, so that they can trade. Um, and the transatlantic trade is, is going to make them um, a little bit more profitable. So uh, while the slaves were coming into the South, um, New England is actually, uh, there's, it's a very wooded area um, when the white folks first arrive. And so they, they use that in order to um, build a number of ships in Rhode Island's sort of at the, the forefront of that, um, which is one of the reasons why the transatlantic trade um, helps New England so much, despite the fact that, that not that many slaves are coming into that region. Uh, this is just, again, you can look through this on your own, but this is some of the early settlements of um, the, the New England area, right? Whether it's Massachusetts, New Hampshire, um, Connecticut, all of that wonderful, those subtle variations. Um, New England's going to continue to expand. Um, that's a fairly common um, sort of theme throughout um, colonization. In fact, as, as uh, more and more Europeans arrive, expansion uh, increases um, to where we'll actually get to a point where the English are trying to uh, limit expansion in, in, the, new, in the new colonies. Um, new Hampshire and Maine um, are, are chartered. Uh, new Hampshire ends up becoming its own um, royal colony. Um, so it becomes one of the 13. Maine does not. Maine actually remains a part of Massachusetts, right? So both of those were um, were chartered out of, uh, essentially out of Massachusetts. New Hampshire and Massachusetts have some land disputes um, that puts them in conflict with one another, which ultimately leads to New Hampshire becoming an official um, royally chartered colony. Um, Connecticut, again, is, is another... Um, offshoot I get to the south of, of, of Massachusetts more along the the Rhode Island um, mindset right so you know more more about religious tolerance um, you know extending uh, suffrage or voting to um, a majority of people um, well I don't want to say majority of people the the white feet, white people right majority of white men let's go that way majority of white men um, by, by this point, um, and we talked about this a little bit earlier when we talked about the, the succession of the English monarchy, um, we do get to the, 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 uh, the glorious revolution in England um, and sort of how that affects the colonies. Because the colonies now, again, you're talking about, I think, I think it's 1660s. Um, again, I'm not a, a, a date. I don't. That's trivial. I don't really care that much about it. But you're you're looking at, at over 50 years now of of colonization in the New World um, before the Glorious Revolution happens. And so, um, you know, the, the, your your New England um, Confederation, they're going to sort of join together because as England deals with itself and deals with its own civil war. Um, the colonies are sort of hung out to dry a little bit. Um, the Dutch uh, and then the French um, had both. So the Dutch had established like New York. Well, it was New, New uh, Amsterdam at the time. Um, but the, the Dutch had established New Amsterdam. The French go down the St. Lawrence River. Uh, I think we talked about this a little bit. And it's sort of the Great Lakes region. And so they're, they're on the other side of the Appalachians. Uh, but they're, they're both uh, uh, seen as sort of a threat to, to New England um, because the, the French are sort of to the north um, in, in, you know, French, Can uh, French Canada and the, the, the Dutch are to the south in New Amsterdam at the time. Um, some of the other colonies, for instance, Virginia and Maryland, um, they don't recognize um, Cromwell's Commonwealth. Uh, they don't they don't. You know, they operate still as if there's a king, um, but you're, you're talking about, you know, again, a two month trip one way. Um, there's not a lot of, of sort of daily interaction and daily involvement um, in all of that. Once the monarchy is restored, however, once the, the restoration occurs, the 
um, the colonies, uh, again, go back and seek new, um, new, new royal charters, right? New, basically, decrees from the monarchy saying that they have a right to operate where they are. Uh, so that brings us to our southern colonies of the Carolinas. Um, the Carolinas are created um, predominantly um, for sort of commercial uh, farming and economic reasons. Um, so there's there's a number of proprietors, owners to the, the region. Um, initially, there's one Carolina um, that will split into two um, relatively quickly. Um, and they'll, they'll get their own royal charters. Um, North Carolina is uh, a little bit more like Virginia um, in terms of tobacco being substantial. A um, lot, of, lot of Virginians actually move south and are, and are, are helping to settle the North Carolina region. Um, south Carolina, on the other hand, um, they have a slave-based economy. So the, some of the, the largest slave numbers um, that come into the, the what is the United States today um, actually go into the South Carolina region. There were um, some coastal towns in South Carolina where uh, the population would have been 90 percent black uh, or 90 percent African, right? So you're, you're looking at 90 percent of the population being slaves. Um, but South Carolina um, is able to sort of control that. There's, there's some rebellions, but not um, not too many. Um, and so ultimately, South Carolina becomes prosperous through uh, commercial agriculture, whether it's uh, rice, sugarcane, indigo. Um, and so some of the the wealthy plantator, plantation owners um, from Caribbean islands um, actually migrate up um, to, to, to South Carolina and, and help establish that colony. Um, uh, early settlements in the South, so all of them, um, I don't think, we've, we haven't talked about any of the others in terms of Native American, well, we talked about Pocahontas, but uh, in the South, in the Carolinas, for instance, um, I told you that, that the Carolinas tried to, um, there, were, there were various whites tried to enslave um, Native Americans, again, if you have a slave culture like South Carolina, um, didn't, didn't bode real well, didn't work real well, um, so that ultimately becomes unsuccessful, but the more interaction between um, whites and natives uh, in your in your in the Carolinas, for instance, the um, the less well it worked out for the natives, right? Um, and so there were a number of sort of skirmishes or what we refer to as wars, um, but ultimately the more interaction and the more sort of um, mingling of the two entities. Um, led to high disease rates. So natives were not um, accustomed to European or English disease. Um, and so for whatever reason, they, they generally fared far worse. Um, and so by, the, by, the, by the, the time that the Carolinas are sort of well established, um, you know, in the mid 18th or mid to, or early to mid 18th century, um, native populations in, in that region of the, of the colonies have, have predominantly died out or um, vacated the region, meaning they've, they've moved elsewhere. I'll let you look over this yourself. Uh, the middle colonies, um, what we refer to as, as sort of the middle colonies, are, are generally New York, New Jersey, Delaware, um, Pennsylvania. Um, I told you initially New York is actually um, New Amsterdam, um, so or New York City is New Amsterdam. Um, I think New York was New Netherlands, like the colony. Anyways, the Dutch had initially settled it. Um, and so even if you go back... Uh, there's still some Dutch remnants um, to New York City um, in this day and age, but uh, it was the, the Dutch's best attempt or best uh, um, foothold into the New World. Um, again, we talked about the French sort of getting down the St. Lawrence and getting over into the to, to central, um, what is central 
uh, America. It's our central United States today. Um, but the new, new, new Amsterdam was, was the Dutch's best foothold um, in what is the United States today. Um, one of the things that the, the, the Dutch um, are, are sort of, I don't want to say known for, um, one of the differences, uh, because the Dutch are operating almost entirely for profit, right? I mean, that's, that's sort of their drive behind everything that they're doing. They're aiming to um, create wealth. Um, they're more inclusive. Um, so if you, I mean, if you look at New York today, New York has a very large Jewish population. Um, that's actually true even, I mean, proportionally. Um, e even back in their founding, like the, the, the Dutch were more um, sort of accepting of, of Jews in New Amsterdam because that provided some economic opportunities. And so their religious toleration, it wasn't, it wasn't some grand like ideal. It wasn't some um, lofty goal or thought. Um, it was basically an economic issue of, man, these people can make me money, so I'm going to let them stay. Um, that's all it is. If, if they had not been able to make the money, they probably would not have been um, nearly as welcome. Um, so when you look at settling the, the middle colonies, um, so you, you see in the map there, um, New Netherlands um, and sort of how it goes up the Hudson River there. Um, but New Jersey is, is established. Um, again, it, it's the middle colonies are um, sort of similar in some ways to Connecticut, Rhode Island um, in that region. They're looking for a little bit more religious tolerance. Um, but there's some um, there are some aspects of of sort of your your southern colonies that are more profit driven as well. Um, so you know, what we refer to as the middle colonies are sort of a blend um, in that regard, right? Uh, when you look at Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania is actually settled by William Penn. Um, Dutch Quakers are some of the ones that go um, further in there. Pennsylvania is in incredibly religiously tolerant. Um, on some level, they need to be because the Quakers are, are viewed as a little eccentric might be the right word um, some of the behaviors of the Quakers are not widely um, accepted or not widely uh, uh, um, endorsed or agreed with um, so on, on some level it, it's actually a little interesting that the Dutch that the, the the that the Quakers in Pennsylvania would be so open to religious tolerance and religious freedom. They, they actually encouraged um, other people, like non-Quakers, to come and settle in the region, so long as you believed in, in like, Jesus, right? They didn't care if you were Calvinist or Lutheran or, or Puritan or whatever. Like, you just had to believe in Jesus. You believed in Jesus, like, come on. Um, and so they were a little bit more... Um, what you would think of as, as I mean, Pennsylvania is probably a good example of what you would think of as being a sort of Christian or religious colony um, in terms of the fact that they, they, you know, they tried to love everybody and they tried to be accepting of everybody that there, there were better um, Native American relations um, in the middle, sort of the middle colonies than there were in some of the other regions. That's just a, a depiction of a Quaker meeting. And again, like I said, they were they were seen as sort of odd in how they practiced their religion. Um, so Georgia, Georgia is one of the last colonies created. Um, it's actually created. Georgia is kind of a, a, a funny story. So one, um, Georgia is created because um, the Carolinas are fairly profitable and they need something between them and Florida. Um, so Florida was established in. I believe 1619 by the Spanish, um, but Florida is a Spanish colony. It's not an English colony, and so um, obviously we we hopefully we know that the English and the Spanish don't always get along. Um, 
There was a fairly substantial war between the two. Um, and so Georgia is established as sort of a, a buffer between South Carolina and Florida. Um, it's also established with this sort of um, ideal utopian concept. And if you don't know what a utopia is, utopia is just a, a word for like the perfect society, right? And so Georgia is essentially created with this um, idea of being classless, meaning there's no elites, there's no poor, everybody's the same, everybody's treated equally, everybody has the same economic opportunity, um, it, it falls apart relatively quickly. One, um, because I mean, like Georgia was, was, was established and there was not supposed to be slavery there. Um, and so I'm sure you can imagine what South Carolina planters did, uh, when they wanted to expand their plantations a little bit, they went into Georgia and they brought their slaves with them and just disregarded those, uh, expectations. And so the utopian ideals of Georgia sort of fall by the wayside very, very quickly. Um, and Georgia becomes a, a slave colony and, and predominant in, in sort of agricultural trade, um, just like uh, South Carolina or North Carolina. Um, so this is just, you can look through this on your own, but this gives you a map of some um, early, early settlements. Um, and then in the green, you can see some of the early Native American tribes and where they were in relation to those early settlements. Um, so the, the sort of relations or the interaction between natives and um, and and the the whites um, was not always a positive. Um, there are instances of cooperation, instances of long-term cooperation. The Iroquois were a decent example of this. Um, so the Iroquois League was a, 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 a confederation um, of of you know, a half dozen or so Native American tribes um, that work together. Um, and so they they actually end up sort of creating a system of laws and structure and government um, that sort of affords them the opportunity um, to be in sort of the good graces of whites. And so they, they, they end up working with the Dutch first and then later with the English. Um, in the New England area, for instance, um, New England, again, we talked about religion being a more prominent aspect of um, what happens or, or why the natives settled and, and, and how they lived their lives. And so they do try to spread Christianity. Assimilation begins occurring um, relatively early um, where they're trying to, to um, uh, uh, you know, uh, be, be missionaries to, to these, these people and, and, and um uh, uh, convert them. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, convert them into uh, convert them to Christianity. Um, and then some of the the, the examples in the the Pequot War is a, a pretty good example of it. Um, is when there were conflicts between natives and and whites. It can be pretty detrimental. And so when you look at the Pequot Nation, for instance, the Pequot Tribe, um, they get into this armed conflict. Uh, and ultimately, like, I mean, by the end of it, and details don't necessarily matter, but, but by the end of it, what happens is the tribe ceases to exist. Um, they're either like wiped out and killed by, by English settlers. They're rounded up, um, and traded off for, um, for African slaves and then sent to the Caribbean, um, and enslaved there, or, um, if they're lucky enough that they get to stay, they basically just dissolve into other tribes and their, their, their sort of heritage um, dies out as a result of, of an ill-fated war with whites. Uh, this is just an Algonquin um, harvesting ceremony depiction. Um, so you're welcome to look at that. Uh, and then King Philip's War, this is um, one of the, the more devastating or bloodier um, conflicts um, that, that ultimately begins um, the, the, the natives are going to um, are going to attack the English and the English are actually tipped off um, by a, a Native American who has been assimilated, who becomes a Christian um, and was actually educated in Harvard College. Um, and so um, he ends up dead, probably executed for treason by by the natives. Um, but then that sort of 
fueled the 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 English response and it tipped the English off so they knew what was coming. Um, and it ends in a, a, a sort of massive, uh, massive just loss of life. Um, so, I mean, the Native American tribe is essentially wiped out. Um, again, like we talked about a second ago, some of the ones that are captured are traded off for African slaves and then sent down to the Caribbean um, so that they can be forced into slavery. Um, but the like in terms of percentages of the population that, that died... Um, it's one of the the, the worst um, conflicts in in U.S. history, right? I mean, even though we're not the United States yet at this point. Uh, this is a, 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 a an advertisement. It's a you know giving you sort of an idea of, of indentured servanthood, which we talked about for a minute, right? And who who can come, um, what they were wanted for, how they operated, um, but it was a Again, a very frequent means of getting um, Europeans here early on. Um, indentured servanthood is actually illegal now. Uh, when when the, the 13th Amendment passes to the U.S. Constitution and it outlaws slavery, it outlaws indentured servanthood as well. Um, sometimes you'll see, um, you know, sort of an alt-right history um, that talks about white slavery um, in, in America, when they talk about white slavery and Irish slavery and whatnot, this is actually what they're referring to. Um, and it was. It was slavery in some sense, um, but in other senses it really wasn't slavery. I mean, one, you, you sort of voluntarily entered into it, and two, um, unlike slavery, there was generally an end date. Now, that was not always true because there were instances in which you would have these masters, for lack of a better term, um, that would would basically be like, Oh, well, you stole from me, so now you owe me another six months, or you did this, so now you owe me another six months, or you did that. And so they would keep adding time on, um, essentially making it impossible for you to ever re-earn or obtain your freedom again. Um, so this is the, the, the depiction of the African slave trade and where they came from. Um, so I'm, as I'm sure you're aware with the 1619 Project, you know that uh, the first African slaves arrived in... Um, what is the United States today in 1619? Uh, but make no mistake, the the vast, vast, vast majority of Africans um, that left Africa did not come to what is the United States today. Uh, they came either to uh, the Caribbean. Uh, there were a number of Caribbean islands um, that were that that ended up being like 90 percent um, black, meaning 90 percent slaves. Um, I mean, you look at Jamaica today. Uh, and Jamaica is is a I mean it's the Jamaicans are black. They're that's just what they are because so many um, Jamaicans, if they if they traced their ancestry back, they would trace it back to uh, African slavery um, and, the, and the African slave trade. Um, Brazil had a a, a a massive number of um, slaves imported into Brazil as well. Um, in both both areas, just just uh, the United States is dwarfed by both in terms of, of um, the number of, of Africans that are brought. Um, I do want you to understand, um, because I was actually taught as a child a sort of misconception um, that, that white Europeans went to Africa and just rounded up a whole bunch of people with guns and then took those people to the United States and sold them for uh, you know, tobacco. Uh, and then they took the tobacco to England and sold the, the, the tobacco for money. And that's not really how the slave trade went down. Um, it, we talked a second ago or a few minutes ago about Africa and, and how there's warring tribes within Africa. Um, so slavery is actually, um, it's, it's existing in Africa at the time. Um, and so when Europeans come down there, they're actually trading um various things to include guns to African nations for slaves that have already been captured as a result of um, sort of warfare between amongst tribes. Um, so the, the losing tribe ultimately sort of becomes the slaves of the winning tribe. Um, and then the winning tribe sort of realizes that it's they're, they're better off sort of shipping them out um, so that they don't run away and try to hide in, in a region in an area that they know. Um, additionally, when they trade them for guns, that, that simply affords them, um, you know, superior technology in order to go and obtain more. Um, and so it sort of becomes a, a cycle 
Uh, this is a depiction of what's called the middle passage, or uh, you've probably seen this in, in um, probably like in your eighth eighth grade, seventh grade. I don't. I think eighth grade. I think eighth grade U.S. history. But you probably saw this. Um, basically, you just you you had. I mean, you had slaves like literally just sort of piled on top of one another it was the conditions were horrific i mean it was a tough passage if you had like a, a cabin and you had paid your way um from europe to to uh to the united states um it, it, it's exponentially worse um when you're a slave and so you're you're given probably one piece of stale bread and some water every day um and you're just laying on other other human beings um, African culture or African heritage does become sort of uh, a key component in the South. Um, so African folklore um, is passed on. Uh, African religious practices still exist in the, uh, um, you know, in the in the New World. Um, so they they while they come here and, and in some some manners they are forced to assimilate. Um, they're they're generally given new names. Um, I mean, in fact, if you look at like black people today, like, like black Americans that, that can trace their ancestry back to, um, to slavery, um, a lot of the times they have, um, sort of very, very white names that were the result of, um, sort of the, the, the forced assimilation of, 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 of Africans, right? So they're, um, they're, they lose their culture in some regards, um, but they try to maintain it in other regards, whether it's religious practices or music. Um, ultimately, their their sort of Christianity is is pushed on them and it's promoted toward them. Um, but even then, there's there's some blending of of, of Christianity and and sort of African religion, right? And so then ultimately, what you what you end up with is is a thriving. Um, set of colonies, right? A, a thriving set of, of um, sort of autonomous um, entities that are uh, making money um, and providing um, sort of uh, wealth to um, to elites in Europe um, and then to the elites in the United States. Um, Many of them started as private companies or private organizations. Privatization is is um, is something that's that's existed in the the, the U.S. for a long time, um, but the the colonies um, it doesn't take long at all uh, for them to um, become very very successful. Um, and that success, that economic success, um, is going to be some of the, some of the the sort of foundations to why uh, we're ultimately going to end up with a revolution, right? So there's a fair amount of autonomy, um, again, because of the, the the distance that has to be traversed in order to um, sort of get orders, right? Like I mean, it takes it was said two months to get from England. Um, to New York, and so New York is capable of sort of governing themselves for the most part, um, and so the the, the colonies are, are well established, um, and eventually we're going to get to revolution. And that's the end for chapter two.